Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fourth national VTS session. Um, we're going to be looking at some AKT revision questions, revision planning for the last week for those that are going to be sitting in October, uh, consultation skills. And then really excited today because I'm joined by Dr. Avishal Sharma, who's joining me all the way from Spain. Um, he's going to talk about his fascinating portfolio GP career and take questions about GP careers in general and portfolio careers uh, specifically. So Avi, if you want to just say hello and then we'll get you off and back again when we're due to start. Hi guys, I'm really looking forward to having a wee question and answer session to maybe go over our portfolio careers um, and I'll catch up with you soon. Okay, thanks very much Avi. I'll see you very shortly. Okay, great. So uh, welcome. I can see someone's joined in all the way from Nova Scotia in Canada. Fantastic. Welcome. Okay, so very brief introduction for those joining for the first time. My name is uh, Dr. Mohibur Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP and the medical director of eMedic. I've got a range of clinical roles um, as well as my main role now is in medical education. So um, in terms of the format, a lot of you have been before. I can see a few new names. Uh, we're going to be doing teaching on three different topics. So the first section will be AKT, then we'll do RCA and consultation skills, and then the last sections on careers. As I mentioned, we're going to start with AKT, then we're going to look at consultation skills, and then the last session will be more um, Avi rather than me. Okay, um, and, but I will hang about for a Q and A right at the end. So if we go straight into AKT, you know, for those sitting in, in October, we've got one week to go. So I'm going to do a few high yield questions. It's actually more than four. Um, we'll give you 55 seconds to look at it, and then I'll launch a poll. Here we go. First questions coming on now. Now, I picked this topic because I had uh, more than one doctor contact me because this was mentioned in the last examiner's report as an area that doctors struggled in. So I thought it'd be good just to do a review of both initiation and adjusting of insulin doses. This is something I have to do at the unit that I, I am a resident GP in. Uh, okay, so I can see that the most popular answer are top three, 12, 16 and 20 units. Okay, about half of the people that picked the poll picked 12 units um, and then the next two that were really popular, 16, 20, but every option has been picked. So it just highlights an area that people struggle with, okay? So the correct answer is A, 12 units. So well done, about half of you got that right, but that means quite a lot of doctors got that wrong, half of you got it wrong. So, you know, um, it is an area we know that a lot of people struggle with. So let me talk you through it, and then I'll come back and actually do a worked example with you. So now there's, a lot of people said that they couldn't find a, like a nice guideline on this. And there is a nice guideline about the general principles of changing from someone who's on oral anti-diabetic medications you know, with type two to starting insulin. And so one of the things that it says is you should continue metformin. You might stop the other drugs, but you should continue metformin so that they've got a baseline. And for most people, the first step would be to add in a basal NPH, also known as isophane um, uh, insulin. So that's an intermediate acting insulin. So you take that at night at bedtime, and then during the day, you're still taking your metformin. And so that means that you're only taking insulin once a day as a basal regime. There are alternatives. So there's a twice daily regime where you take it in the morning and the evening, or you could have a lower basal dose and then take a bolus dose before every single meal. But that's more complex and not normally what you'd go straight to. OK, so to calculate the total daily insulin requirement is quite straightforward. You take their weight and it's half a unit of insulin per kilogram. So if someone weighs 80 kilograms, they're going to need 40 units as their total daily insulin regime. However, because you're going to continue metformin, you don't want to give them that much insulin. Otherwise, they're going to have hypos. So the basal requirement is 50% of the total requirement. Because can you say the basal requirement is a baseline and you're topping up with your metformin. So that's half of it. But then when you're first putting someone on insulin, 
there's a risk that they're going to be very sensitive and you'll actually have high pose. So what you do is it's called a safety dosing. You take 60% of what you think the basal requirement is to start and then monitor and then you can adjust upwards. Do you see, they've already been running high sugars for a long time. That's why you're starting them on insulin, right? They're poorly controlled despite oral medication. What you don't want to do is go too high on insulin and they have significant high pose. That's more risky, isn't it? Than that they, you know, are still running a little bit high, but probably not as high as before you added insulin. And then you slowly increase the insulin. So generally you're going to administer the insulin at bedtime. So let's do the calculation. Okay, so look, this patient was 80 kilograms. Okay, we're gonna continue his metformin, right? His daytime metformin is gonna continue. And so we just wanna work out how much insulin to put him on. So first step, how much does he need in total? It's just half a unit per kilogram. So if he's 80 kilograms, 0.5, times 80 is 40 units, okay? So a few people that picked E, that's why you got it wrong, is that you just calculated the total requirement. Now, quite a few people also then picked 20 units. What you've done there is you've done the next step, which is working out the basal dose. The basal dose is half of their total requirement. So if they need 40 in total, half of that is 20, right? Okay, and then remember when we're initiating, we don't wanna go hypo, so we, we start with what's called the safety dose, okay? So the initial safety dose is 60% of that. So 60% of 20 is 12, okay? So that's how we've done the calculation, you see? So work out how much they need, that's straightforward, half times their weight, okay? Um, and then the basal dose is half of that again, and then the safety dose is 60% of that. So there's three steps, quite difficult calculation, but that's why a lot of people struggled with it when it was in the exam in the past. Uh, the examiners mentioned this in the last examiner's report from the last exam. So that's why I wanted to specifically cover it, okay? Uh, someone's asked, are there any variations in calculation uh, of insulin if the patient was obese? Well, because it's based on weight, if they were obese, you're sort of factoring that in. And that's also why you factor in a safety dose. It's much better to be a bit on the low side. They've already been running high for a long time, right? That's why you're starting them on insulin and then go up slowly from that then to go too high and then you might end up uh, giving them a hypo. Now, there are lots of variations and lots of local guidelines. There isn't one, like the NICE guideline talks about what to start, but it doesn't have specific dosing. What I've done is I've looked at lots of different local ones from different hospitals, different uh, primary care based guidelines. And this is the one that's most common. It's the one mentioned in GP notebook, okay? Right, let's do the next one. Interesting thing is, again, every single option has been picked. The most popular answers are, again, A, B, and C. So no adjustment, about a fifth of you. Just over half, increased by two. Um, after that, increased by four. And the interesting, some people talked about decreasing by two and decreasing by four. Again, it highlights it's a difficult question. And there are two main things, right? How to start it and then how to adjust it. So, um, this is something that I'm more familiar with because I'm, I'm regularly adjusting people's doses that have been started by someone in hospital, okay? So they're on 24 units now as their basal regime and they're still on metformin. So what we're gonna do, we'll have a look at their readings for the last five days that they've recorded. And the pre-breakfast dose, um, can you see they're all a little bit on the high side, right? So what we want is we definitely want to be increasing insulin, not decreasing. So the first step is to eliminate d &E. Okay, if they were on target, just type into the chat, what is the target? Where would we like it to be? What's the range when someone's um, on insulin? Normally we would get them, if they're on a once daily regime, we normally get them to check their bloods in the morning before breakfast. 
if someone's on a basal bolus regime, they normally check it before every meal. OK, um, so what, where would we like it? What's the target that we'd like it to be? So what we'd like to do is we'd like to get it somewhere between four and seven. OK, that would be ideal. Right, somewhere around that. Now you can see all of these are running high. Okay. Now you might have someone who mostly runs high and they have one that's a bit low. Okay. What you're looking at is their pattern. Like if they had one or two days they're high and they're normally in range, they're normally sort of five, six, six and a half, maybe even just above seven, and they have the odd day, you're not going to suddenly increase, incre increase the insulin because then you risk that they have hypos. Okay. So what we're going to do, the correct answer is B you want to increase by two units daily. And that's because of how high it is. So again, let's have a look at why. So you only adjust if they're regularly above or regularly below the target. If they only have like the odd day, um, that's why you don't base it just on one reading on one day. You know, you wanna have a look at a, a trend. Generally, in terms of how often you'd ask someone on a once uh, daily basal regime, you just ask them to check it once a day in the morning before breakfast. Okay, now if it's between four and seven, or generally in that range, that's perfect. Leave it alone. If it's less than four or if they're having high pose, reduce the insulin by four units. Get them to check it again for a few days and see how they're getting on. And then you might adjust again. If it's regularly above seven but below 14, then increase by two. That was this patient. Whereas if it was regularly above 14, a sky high, then you increase by four. Even then, can see we're not suddenly increasing by eight or 16 or 20. Why? Because what you don't want to do is you know, the big risk with insulin is that they have a significant hypo, isn't it? Okay, so that's why you increase it gradually and then see how they respond. Okay, so generally, you know, I try to get my patients so that if they're not in range, that, you know, as soon as they are, we see, a, say, a week's worth when they're in this range, go up to a time rather than wait till they've, you know, gone there. Because someone rarely jumps from being in control to suddenly jumping to him. Okay, that's how you're going to adjust the insulin. In terms of Someone with data, can you see it's different every day? I'm going to move on to stats now, but using real life data. So like this could be real life data from a patient. Have a look at this question. And again, I'll give you 55 seconds to have a look at it. I can see most people have put the correct answer, which is 11.6. Got a few people that have uh, calculated something different, um, either a little bit lower or a little bit higher. And sometimes what people do is some people, they round up and they think, you know what, you wouldn't give 11.6 units and they put 12 because they think, you know, I'm gonna give 12 units. You wouldn't get a mark for that. No human looks at this, mark by computer. Look what the question says. What's the mean glucose reading to one decimal place? See, this isn't a clinical question, it's a stats question. And so the, the only answer that would get you a mark is 11.6. If you put 11.6, that'd be fine. If you put 11.6 millimoles per, per liter, that'd be fine. But 11.6 must be there. Anything else, so someone that put, for example, 12, which is rounded up, you wouldn't get a mark for that, okay? Someone that put 11, you wouldn't get a mark for that. Any other number, you wouldn't get a mark for that, okay? So all we do, the, the mean is the mathematical or arithmetic average. All you do is you add up the numbers. So you add these numbers up, you get 58. You divide by the five days. That gives you 11.6, okay? You have an on-screen calculator in the exam. Okay, what about this? This one, straight away, you can type into the chat. The answer is 12.4. Why? Because, again, part of exam technique is reading the question. It's asking for the mode. The mode is a different type of average. It's the most frequently appearing um, number. So can you see that 12.4 appears twice? All of the others only appear once. So there's no maths here. It's just look, knowing the definition and seeing that the only thing that appears more than once. 
And actually, again, the mode is quite useful here. So let's say, for example, they had three days where it was 12.4. And then they had one day when it was six. In terms of working out how should I adjust this, can you see, you can see, okay, they're mostly a little bit on the high side. They had one day when they were in control, but they're mostly high. I probably need to add in a bit of extra insulin to try and bring it down. Do you see? Okay. So in terms of averages, the mean is the one that most people think of when they hear the word average. It's the mathematical or arithmetic average. Add up the numbers, divide by the number of patients, or in this case, by the number of days. Okay. The mode is the most frequently appearing variable in a set of data, the most common value. All right. And then the median is the middle value in an ordered list. So you'd first put them from lowest to highest, find the one in the middle. It's particularly useful if you've got skewed data to use the median. Okay. Right. Let's do one more stats question about data interpretation. This is one of the new style questions um, mentioned in the latest RCGP examiner's stats update. OK, so I can see in the poll, every single answer option has been picked. And the, the popular ones are C and G. About a quarter of you each have picked those. After that, it's D. And then all the others, a few people. I, again, it's something that people struggle with. OK, now this is not something that needs you to do any calculation. It's just getting familiar. This is real life data. This is from uh, a health board in um, a local health board in uh, uh, Scotland. OK, um, and so. If you just get familiar with the kind of data, and this is a, a metric very commonly used by commissioning groups or health boards or local health boards to compare one practice to another is how many antibiotic prescriptions are you dispensing per thousand patients per day? Another metric, how many of those prescriptions are for broad spectrum antibiotics? Okay. Um, other metrics, you know, um, how often are you prescribing benzodiazepines or sleeping drugs or, or things like that? Okay. So in which quarter did this practice have their lowest use of antibiotics in all age groups. OK, so the first thing is to see that the practice is here. The green one is the practice. The dark blue one is the health board average. And then the turquoise one is the regional 25th percentile. OK, i.e. 25% of practices will be lower than this. It's the bottom quarter. That's where you're aiming for. Right. OK. So you can see the first thing is just to make sure that you're reading off the right chart, because a lot of people, what they were doing is they're looking at the dark blue one, which is actually the average for the whole health board, the local health board, not for that practice. So the, the only line we care about is the green line. OK, and then the question saying, in which quarter did they have their lowest use of antibiotics in all age groups, which is this is showing antibiotics in all ages thousand per thousand patients per day. So all you're looking for is the lowest point of the green dot. Can you all see that's here? If I draw a line to it, you can see that's significantly lower than here. OK. And after that, all you're doing is you're looking at which quarter this is. So this is July to September 15th. Quarter one is January, February, March. So we split the year into four quarters for reporting purposes in general practice. OK. So quarter one is January, February, March. Quarter two is April, May, June. Quarter three, July, August, September, and then quarter four is October, November, December. I, you're splitting each year into four sections of three months each. OK, so here, can you see it's July to September? So that's the first step is just recognizing that the next step is working out which quarter this is. So look, January, February, March, quarter one, April, May, June, quarter two, July, August, September, quarter three. So it's quarter three in 2015. So G is the right answer. But for example, only a quarter of people got that right. So a lot of people struggle with this. So common mistakes people will make. Some people, they just won't be able to interpret the quarters. OK, so they might have actually got this, but just thought it was a different quarter. That's a common mistake. Other mistakes, a lot of people, they think, OK, 
Here, it's significantly lower than the rest of the health board. Whereas, although this is a lower figure, it's the same. But they weren't asking, when was it lower compared to others? The question was just, when did they have their lowest use? You can see, you can see here, they had like 1.3 per thousand patients. Whereas here, it's closer to 1.5, which is lower, 1.3. So it's just getting familiar with this type of data. And this type of data is available from Public Health uh, England. Uh, we'll post a link for you um, where you can find this information. Okay. So the great thing about these type of data interpretation type questions, and there's lots of them, is that um, you know you don't need to do any calculation. You don't need to get your calculator out. You don't need to learn complex formulae. Uh, and so you could expect a few of the questions to be data interpretation. There will be some questions expecting you to calculate things. So you do need to know how to calculate things like relative risk and absolute risk reduction and numbers needed to treat and sensitivity and specificity and positive predictive value and so on. So you know, I'll talk to you about how you can cover all of those things later. All right. So let's move on to the admin domain and look at one last question. NHS complaints. This is the last one. Then we're going to move on to consultations. Popular answers are ENF. Um, lots of people have picked ENF, and then after that, A and B are very popular as well. Okay, that'll do. I think I'll close the polling off there. Okay, so question is about NHS complaints. So which two of the following statements about NHS complaints? That's a really important word here. In GP are correct. So the correct answers are D and E. So actually, hardly anyone would have got a mark for this question, and that's because only eight percent of people, less than ten percent, pick D. So Loads of you picked E, but you see, if you pick E and you didn't put, pick D as your second one, you picked any of the others as your second one, you wouldn't get half a mark in the AKF, you'd get nothing. You either get it all right, you get one mark, you get it partially wrong, you get nothing. It's quite strict the way it's marked. So let's look at the ones that are incorrect first and why they're incorrect. So option A, complaints must be made within 12 months of an issue occurring. That's almost right, but it's not. It must be made within 12 months of an issue occurring or within 12 months of the patient finding out that there was an issue. So actually it could be years later. I'll give you an example. Let's say now a patient comes and they've had some rectal bleeding and the doctor doesn't examine them and instead just gives them some hemorrhoid cream. And it seems to help with their symptoms for a little bit. They carry on having low levels and they just keep using the cream. And in future, they just buy it over the counter. Anyway, several years later, they also start losing weight. They get referred to hospital and they found to have a metastatic bowel cancer, at which point they mentioned that they'd been having bleeding for years and that the first time they had it, the doctor didn't examine them and just gave them hemorrhoid cream. And the surgeon says, well, that's interesting because that would be really important. It may be that you've had this longer and it might have been picked up. Now the patient realizes, you know what, I'm not happy about this. Maybe if I'd been examined, if someone had actually done a rectal examination at that point, they might have picked something up earlier or if they'd referred me sooner, they might have picked something up earlier. From that point, they realize there's an issue, they've got 12 months. You see, that could be three, four years later. So that's why A is incorrect. Option B, complaints must be made in written form, letter, email, or fax. You can make it verbally. You could just go to the practice manager and say, I'd like to lodge a, a complaint, okay? Option C, complaints on behalf of others are only accepted with consent from that person, i.e. the person who had an issue. That's also incorrect. There are certain exceptions Generally, you need consent, but you can make complaints on behalf of others without consent if they can't consent. I'll explain who they are in a minute. And then the last one that's wrong and why it's wrong, F, complaints can be made about any issue that occurred on the practice premises or on a home visit. No, they can only be made about anything that's related to NHS work. So let's say now someone comes to the practice and they want to get a medical to become a lorry driver. That's not covered by the NHS. They'll be charged a fee for that. It's private work. 
they cannot use the NHS complaints procedure, which is what this question was about, to make a complaint. Even though that examination happened on practice premises, you can't make a complaint about non-NHS things in the NHS complaints procedure. The practice might have a separate complaints procedure for things that are non-NHS, okay? But it doesn't fall within the NHS complaints procedure. They couldn't take that complaint to the PCO, for example, or the NHS health ombudsman. It's just not possible. So that's why F is wrong. If we look at D and E, patients generally would complain to the practice first, but they can bypass us and go directly to the health board or the CCG, i.e. the commissioning primary care organization without involving the practice. And then when a complaint comes in under the NHS complaints uh, policy, we should send an acknowledgement within three working days. Okay, so D and E are correct. You'd need them both right to get the one month. So let me summarize NHS complaints. Should be made within 12 months of the incident or within 12 months of becoming aware of the issue, which could be much longer than 12 months of it actually happening. Can be made verbally or in writing or via email. You know, any of those is fine. They can be made on behalf of others with consent and even without consent if, for example, let's say now a family member passed away and you felt that they hadn't been treated properly, you could make a complaint about that. You can't get their consent because they're deceased, but you're making a complaint on their behalf. Or if you've got a young child and you feel that they weren't treated properly, if that child is not Gillick competent, i.e. they're not mature enough to give consent, you can complain on their behalf without their consent. Or one of your family members has got dementia and it's very advanced and they lack capacity, but you feel that they've not been treated correctly. Again, you can complain on their behalf. They can't give consent, do you see? So consent's not always needed if the person can't consent. And then someone can complain either to the practice or directly to the commissioning PCO. That's the commissioning group in England or the local health board, the health board in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. We have to send an acknowledgement within three working days to explain what we're going to do. I, you know, we're going to look into this and we'll get back to you. There's no set time frame for a full response, but if it's going to take longer than six months, you should let them know, look, it's take, going to take longer than this because there were multiple doctors involved or the nurse was also involved. We have to get statements from other people. We're trying to gather the information. I let them know what's happening. And if they're not happy with the first line complaint handling, I, either the practice or the PCO, then they can take it to the relevant health ombudsman. So each country has its own health ombudsman. OK, they could take it to there. OK, so I just wanted to cover because these are topics that people often miss, but they're easy marks in the exam. So just two minutes on revision planning for the last week, for those of you sitting in October. And some of you might want to go and carry on doing some AKT revision while I carry on. I know some people have told me that. So what's really important to do in this last week? Revise all your key stats topics. Revise all your key admin topics. Why? While these two are only 20% of the exam, they're well circumscribed. And if you cover them well, they're relatively easy marks. I've seen many doctors get 80, 85, 90 in stats and admin. Then you can get away with 70 in clinical, which is very achievable. If you can't get a good score in stats and admin, you need at least 75 in clinical. Otherwise, you will not pass AKT. So it's important to recap all your key stats topics, all your key admin topics. Then revise all the high yield clinical topics. I, these are clinical topics that the examiners mentioned in the examiner's reports in the last few years. They tend to retest these again and again and again. That's why we wanted to cover insulin. That's why our high yield clinical grammar last week we covered COVID, okay? Because the examiners mentioned that in the last examiner's report. Try to do at least one full-time mock, and hopefully some have already done at least one. So maybe try and do one more in this last week, okay? Uh, where you sit down for three hours and 10 minutes and do 200 questions in one go. This will allow you both to then look back at the ones you get wrong and fill in any gaps in your knowledge. Boost your exam techniques so you get used to answering questions from different subjects, you know, managing your time, things like spotting the keywords. Uh, you know, for example, if it didn't mention NHS complaint, it just mentioned a complaint, then it'd be fine that you could complain about anything that happened in the practice or on a visit. But specifically, it was about NHS complaints, okay? And it also gets, helps you to build stamina. A lot of doctors, the first time they've ever sat down for three hours and 10 minutes in one go and done an exam is at the exam. And then they often realize it's really difficult to concentrate for that long or to keep, you know, sort of your energy up. So you build stamina. And then if you haven't already been following the AKT 30 day challenge videos, please go through them all. There's 30 high yield topics. I've been posting one every day in the group. Someone uh, from the team will post the link to the Facebook group and also to our YouTube channel where you can watch them. Um, so, you know, there's lots of free stuff that we offer that will help you in this last week. If you're not a member of either the GP training support group or the AKT study group, join there and watch back the videos. I'll be posting the rest, you know, tomorrow, the day after and so on. Um, or you can watch the AKT 30 day challenge videos that you've missed directly on our YouTube channel. We've been doing these sessions and the lockdown learning sessions since March. There's like 15 odd hours worth of free um, learning 
on our YouTube channel. And then if you missed the AKT High Yield Revision webinar that we did at the beginning of October, it's 15 high yield questions like the ones we've done with answers and explanations. Uh, that's available, the recording, again, for free. And then if you want support for other things that we offer, if you want to cover all of the stats in just one evening, in three and a bit hours, rather than spending days on it, because you've only got seven days, then our Stats Made Simple webinar that we ran last week, it's just over three hours. The recording's been updated and it's available. It's 46, seven questions I think we went through, 60 plus stats topics, and there's a handout with rapid reviews of all the topics. There's worked examples of all the calculations. We look through the new style graphs. Our organizational domain webinar, covers all of the admin topics, so 45 questions, 60 plus topics. Again, there's a handout where we summarize all the things you need, uh, you know, the, the GMS contract, uh, PMS, APMS, all of those things. And then the high yield clinical grammar that we ran last Thursday, 57 questions, 70 plus topics. That one's three and a half hours, okay? Again, the recording for any one or all three is available. Um, and then this Sunday, we ran our AKT 200 question mock grammar. We did 450 question teaching mock, so 200 questions by the end of the day, but more importantly, reviewed 160 clinical guidelines and topics, uh, 20 stats topics, 20 admin topics, okay? Um, and then if you just want a full mock, we've got a full online mock. Again, someone will post a link for you. Um, 200 questions, all with explanations afterwards. We can do it as a full-timed mock, either with standard timing or extended timing for those with neurodiversity that have additional timing in the exam, okay? Um, if you want to get these as a bundle, We've got our masterclass webinar bundle, which has the stats webinar, the admin webinar, the high yield clinical. So there's 150 odd questions. There's three PDF booklets. Um, it's over 10 hours of learning. These are 79 pounds for anyone, 199 for all three. So they're already discounted. Or we've got the AKT booster bundle, which is our AKT 200 plus the masterclass. So that includes all three webinars, then the full day AKT 200 question crammer course. So that's eight plus hours. And then the full online mock all in one package. If you bought all of those separately, it'd be over 470. So on our website, if you want the webinars, if you just want any one, just click the one you want, okay? Let's say you just want stats. Subscribe now, and you can just have any one, or you can have all three, or you can have the bundle, okay? And then similarly, if you go to our website and just go to AKT200, again, go down to subscribe now, because these are for the actual dates, you know, the physical dates for January, the live dates. Subscribe now, you can either just have the AKT200, or you've got the, the full bundle, which is AKT 200 plus all three webinars plus the mock, okay? If you click that, that's already discounted. For those that are, got AKT this week, if you're not gonna stay, all the best. I hope you found that helpful, but let's move on to a sample consultation. So here's the background. Have a look at this. I'm gonna be the patient, and then we're gonna do the consultation. I will open up the chat now. So let's say now I've come in to see you, you know, because I've been triage, headache, no symptoms, you've decided to call me in. I've come in now, okay? So let's say that you've introduced yourself, and you've done all of that, you've checked who I am. Let's just make a start from after that, okay? So would like someone like to just type into the chat what you'd like to ask me, and I'll answer live as the patient, okay? We're just gonna spend 10 minutes doing this so that we've got 15 minutes for Dr. Sharma. If someone's asked her how long you'd get access to the webinar, it's up to you. You can subscribe for one month, two months, three months, six months, 12 months. It's entirely up to you, okay? Um, okay, so let's make a start. So in the chat, so someone said, how can I help today? Doc, it's these headaches. Uh, it's just getting too much. I really need some help. Someone said, can you tell me a bit more? Well, I mean, I've had them on and off, mm, I'd say the last six months, but these last sort of mm, about five, six weeks, they're just getting really, really much worse. Okay, someone said, tell me more about your headaches. Well, what else do you want to know, doctor? When did they start? The first time I noticed it, as I said, it was about six months ago. And then I didn't have one for ages. I think about four months ago, I had the second one. But like these last sort of five, six weeks, I'm, I'm getting them a lot more. Where is it? It is almost always on the right side, although sometimes it will come on the left, but usually it comes on the right-hand side. Is there anything that makes it worse? Uh, yeah, so when I've got it, I find that if I move too much, that can make it worse. I tend to just lie down and, and rest until it sort of wears off, but that's not always possible. Uh, and then very bright lights can make it sort of like, it just makes it feel like it's pulsing if I get a very bright light. So again, I tend to, that's one of the problems is affecting work because they have really bright lights there. Um, but like if I'm at home, 
it's okay. I just like I close the blinds and I just hide under the covers. Where exactly do I feel it? It's, it's right across, sort of like, can you see it? Right across here on the left hand side. Have I had my eyes checked recently? Well, I wear glasses. So I, I think I had my last eye check about six months ago. My prescription hasn't changed for uh, about a year. Can I describe the headache? I'd say it's like, how to describe it? I mean, it's just like a headache, you know? Um, it's just achy and the pain is just there, you know? But what what's bothering me is that it's very strong. You know, like up until six months ago, obviously I, I've had some headaches here and there, but I've never had one this strong before. And, it's, it, you know, it's like normally you get a headache, it gets better after half an hour, you just take a paracetamol. That's, that's not touching it. Someone's asked any aura. Now here's a good example. Like if you ask that to a patient, most patients are gonna say this, what's an aura doctor? I've not heard that word before. Can you explain it to me? You see, so it's important that you think about how you use auras. You know, it's a good question to get to the bottom of. It's important for us to understand it as doctors, but for most patients, they won't understand what you mean by that. So you've got to think, how are you going to actually ask these patients these questions, right? So any blurring of vision? No, no, no blurred vision. Any dizziness? No, I wouldn't say I feel dizzy, but I, I, I feel, I feel like you know when it's been dragging on. I feel like I've got no energy. So I just need to lie down. Anything happened recently? Well, yeah, um, I mean, I've been quite stressed because during like the first lockdown, I was on furlough. And so, I mean, they kept me on. They were giving me 80% of uh, my pay. So that was a bit hard because I was just about coping as it is. Uh, the thing is now um, they've got me back, but on partial hours. And then the, the top up isn't as much. So I'm, I'm down to about 60% of my original income so that's been quite stressful i've been looking for a job somewhere else to be honest to see if i can get back up to my full income but it's really difficult like nowhere is hiring and uh, you know even if you find uh, the one place i applied to they had 200 applications and like most of them more qualified than me so i haven't got a degree or anything so nothing any weakness on my arms no yeah a any trauma what do you mean by that doctor like have i banged my head or something no nothing like that no What's my sleep like? Oh, that, that's that's another nightmare, Doc. So like, because I've been a bit stressed about this whole job and not having enough, enough income, I, I'm a bit worried about, like they can't kick me out at the moment because you know there's a restriction on evictions. So I've got a feeling my landlord wants to kick me out because I'm a bit behind on the rent. And so I've been finding that that's really playing in my mind. So I, 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 I would definitely say I don't sleep a full night's sleep. Um, Definitely the last month, I've not had one full night's sleep. Like I'll sleep for a few hours, but then I wake up and I can't get to sleep straight away because I'm worrying about things. I'm running through my mind. Okay. Um, any weight loss? That's a bit of a strange question, doctor. I mean, um, no, I think I'm quite a healthy weight. Not lost any weight. Yeah, I'm un under a lot of stress, definitely. How's my appetite? Well, when I've got it, I, I feel sick, so I don't feel like eating. Um, but generally, I've got a good appetite. You know, have I been using to deal with my stress? I've definitely been smoking more. You know, I used to, I'd actually stopped before lockdown, but then the stress of it got to me. I started back again. And lately now I, I've been smoking probably about 10 a day just to, you know, help with the stress a little bit. How often am I getting them? I'm getting, I'd say at least two a week. Um, these last five, six weeks, I'm getting like, yeah, I'd say one or two headaches a week. And sometimes, you know, it lasts all day, so I can't go to work. Okay, someone's asked any rash. That's a strange question, Dr. Bakhti. Now they ask, so my eczema's come back. You know, I haven't had a flare of eczema for years, but it's flared right up on my elbows, uh, which is where I used to have it bad. But um, so actually, um, I don't have any cream for that now because I've not had it for so long. Um, so I've just bought like just normal cream from Superdrug. But I could maybe get some help with that as well. Any symptoms before the headache? No, I don't get any. Just when it starts, it you know, like it doesn't go straight to full intensity. It starts, then I, I can feel it getting worse and worse. And then I feel sick. And then I just try to rest. If I don't rest, you know, it'll just stay really bad. Um, I take some painkillers. I've taken paracetamol. I tried some ibuprofen. None of that's helped. Um, so I just need some help, Doc.
Okay, right, great. I'll, I'll stop you there. Okay, good. So let's look at data gathering here. All right, so you've asked a lot of these questions and you want to find out where is it? If someone's got bilateral headache, you're going to be thinking about things like tension headache. If it's unilateral, you know, it broadens your differential. So you might be thinking about migraine. You might be thinking about brain tumor. You might be thinking about meningitis. You know, how long does it last? So the fact that it can last a whole day, that's a useful clue, isn't it? You know, how often they're getting it? What's the description of it? How severe is it? Do they get nausea, vomiting? You know, there's a light effect. One of the things you've got to start getting in the habit of asking specific questions. You know, at the beginning, it's great. How can I help? Tell me a bit more. That's fine. After that, if you say, tell me a bit more about your headache or is there anything else? You'll find a lot of patients, they don't know what you want. So if you don't ask specifics, like they're often not going to say that actually my hearing goes a bit funny. Whereas, or if I hear loud noises, it makes it worse. You need to specifically say, you know, do you find that loud noises make your pain worse? Are you finding that you're turning the TV down? Are you turning the volume down, uh, you know, on, on things? Um, so we found out about stress, sleep, uh, could ask about eating. So, uh, you know, missed meals can often, and, and then people had asked about impact on patients' life. And you found that it's taken so far, paracetamol and ibuprofen. So what do you think this is? What do you think the diagnosis is? Don't worry about what the patient thinks it is, okay? What do you think it is? A lot of you asked that, all right? He just thinks it's a bad headache, but he wants it sorted, okay? So what do you think is going on? So this could well be a migraine, couldn't it, okay? And the stress could have been a trigger for it. And then in relation to that, the lack of sleep could also be a trigger for it. Great. It doesn't sound like a tension headache. Tension headaches don't last all day. Okay. That's not typical of it to last all day and for it not to respond to paracetamol and ibuprofen. Okay. It typically isn't going to be unilateral, typically not going to feel sick. Um, he mentioned that, you know, the bright lights make it worse. Again, none of those things fit with tension headache. This fits a lot more with a migraine, doesn't it? Okay. Great. Okay. So when to diagnose migraine without aura. So they're getting recurrent episodes lasting anywhere from four hours to three days. Type in the chat, how many episodes do you need to have separate episodes before you can say this is definitely migraine? According to the diagnostic criteria from BASH, the British Association for the Study of Headache, how many separate episodes do you need before you can say this is definitely migraine? Just type it into the chat. Okay. Uh, it's either associated with photophobia or phonophobia or both. No one asked about phonophobia, but if you had asked, he had both. So he had photophobia, but he also had phonophobia. He had nausea. He didn't have vomiting, but he did have nausea, okay? And then you want at least two of the following. So unilateral. In children, it's actually more commonly bilateral, but it, it's an adult, so it should be unilateral, which it was. That it's often pulsating in character. It's moderate to severe. So he had this. It's aggravated by routine physical activity. He said even just doing, you know, some movements, okay? So he had one, two three can you see so that fits and how many episodes you need to have five you need to have five separate episodes that fulfill these criteria before you say okay it's definitely migraine all right now he didn't have an aura but when would you think about aura is that before they get it they get typical sort of visual or sensory symptoms so sometimes they might have a dysphagia or they might have like a funny smell or like tingling or sort of floating lights or something like that or flickering lights or you know, wavy lines or vision goes a bit funny or pins and needles. So again, I'm glad that people asked about that. Because how you ask is about the specific symptoms. You wouldn't ask someone, have you had an aura? The patient's not going to know what that means. Okay. So now I'm in front of you. I'm in clinic. What would you like to examine? You've got a hold of me. What would you like to check as I'm here? So main things really would be pulse, blood pressure, temperature. Someone asked, have you had a fever? But, you know, the patient might have an infection and not know it. Uh, and then fundoscopy. That's probably the most important things, really, okay, that you want to look at, given that they're a young man, he's 22, all right? Um, you know, you could still have something that's causing, you know, high uh, intracranial pressure. You might see some changes on, on fundoscopy. The blood pressure might be high because he's stressed. You see, things like that. A few people are saying, asking about things like temporal tenderness. While that wouldn't be wrong, it's not really very likely that a 22-year-old is going to have giant cell arthritis. So you're not really going to add much by that. You see, and especially if they didn't describe a symptom of something like, you know, when I comb my hair, it hurts or something like that. It's just something that's actually very unlikely to yield. It wouldn't be wrong to do it, but it's not going to add much. It's very unlikely, right? Okay. Okay, good. So we've diagnosed migraine. How are we going to manage this patient? Okay, what are you going to do? He's tried paracetamol. He's tried ibuprofen. They've not helped. What are you going to prescribe me? He's 22 years old. 
let's say you've examined him and examination is normal. So you haven't found any other cause. So it does fit with, you know, typical migraine without aura. So what would be first line treatment for an acute attack for an adult? Right, so acute treatment, first line in the current guidelines is a combination of an oral tryptan and then either an NSAID or paracetamol. So you're gonna give like sumatriptan, for example, 50 or 100, and then give it with it paracetamol or ibuprofen or something like that. Don't use ergos, don't use opioids. Even if they're not being sick, it's worth giving them an antiemetic. So like metoclopramide, domperidone, prochlorperazine, any of these will, will be fine. And then any patient that you're gonna start on tryptans, it's important you tell them to take it as soon as they start feeling it just starting a little bit, and then you know, you're gonna follow up to see how they get on, okay? Now, what's the first line? Let's say this wasn't a 22 year old. What if they were 16? Or if they were 15, right? Let's say they were 15. What would be the first line then? So if someone was 15, you can't give them oral tryptans. Well, you could, but what would be better would be a nasal tryptan, okay? For someone 12 to 17, a nasal tryptan would be better if they've tried paracetamol and ibuprofen. It's not work because first line is either paracetamol or ibuprofen for 12 to 17 year olds. If that fails, it's nasal, not oral. OK, um, and you wouldn't give metoclopramide to someone under 16 because of a risk of which symptom? It's fine for adults, but not for someone under 16 because of extra pyramidal symptoms like tardive dyskinesia. What else would you not give? That, let's say this patient said, I don't want two treatments. I want one thing. You could give me aspirin 900. You couldn't give that to a 15 year old, why? Risk of Ray syndrome, okay, okay. So first line for 12 to 17 would be paracetamol ibuprofen. If they've tried that and they're not effective, then it'd be a nasal trip down. So in terms of acute treatment, let's say this patient, they're vomiting rather than just having nausea and the vomiting means they can't take orals. Again, you could use a nasal or subcutaneous trip down. You could use a non-oral NSAID like a diclofenac suppository, but that would be an unlicensed use, okay? And then if they prefer a monotherapy, you could just give an oral tryptan mono or uh, aspirin high dose, 900 milligrams, okay, or NSAID monotherapy. You know, these are all possible, but he'd try that, okay. And in terms of non-medical, so look, look at the triggers, assess and reduce them. So the fact that he's been stressed, maybe he might benefit from mindfulness or, you know, you could maybe take a bit more history to see if he's got to the point of low mood um, and whether they need help for that. The lack of sleep, so sleep hygiene, maybe keeping a diary, uh, diet, maybe they're not eating well or things like that. People often do that when they're stressed. And then other things, the eczema's flared up. So don't forget to be more holistic. Beyond the migraine, you've got to think about maybe giving them a short course of uh, mild steroid, like hydrocortisone, one or two and a half percent, something like that, for a week or so, alongside some emollients. And in terms of interpersonal, it'd be really important to have lots of empathy to explain, look, this is, if it's confirmed that it's migraine, that, you know, this isn't something that goes away, but we can work out what brings it on for you. We can try to manage it. It's a long-term condition. There's no cure for it, okay? Um, you could think about other things, like the fact that smoking can actually, while it might give him some stress relief, in some cases, for some patients, smoking can trigger migraine. So we might need to look at helping him with, with things like that as well, okay? So this is modified from one of 100 cases like this in our CSA 100 case crammer. Again, someone will post a link for that. Very useful for anyone that's preparing for RCA or anyone that is about to start or is in their first GP rotation and just wants to know how do I deal with 100 important or common conditions that might come in GP, okay? For those preparing for RCA, uh, we've got our RCA masterclass webinar recording is available now, which includes all of the new changes from the November exam onwards, like the new mandatory cases, the marks you lose if you don't submit certain types of cases, um, the new mark scheme, and five interactive cases with simulators. And then our full day RCA course, which includes 25 cases with simulators and lots of individual practice and feedback. Next available date, 17th December for that one. The November course is fully booked. The first December course is fully booked. Um, and we take small group, lots of practice with lots of simulators and trainers. So there's like myself and another trainer, male film simulator, male and female simulator, uh, and we take nine or possibly 10 going forward uh, registrars. Okay, great. So I now want to invite back uh, to the stream, Dr. Avishal Sharma, who's a portfolio GP. I mentioned last week about portfolio GP, someone with multiple roles. So, you know, Dr. Sharma, I've known for, must be coming up to 12, 13 years now, I think maybe longer since he came to the first course. Um, um, yeah, maybe 15 odd years actually. Um, so anyway, Dr. Sharma, as he mentioned, is a portfolio GP. He'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, and you know, he's a hot yoga, certified hot yoga instructor. So I'm gonna hand you over now 
to Avi. Let me see if I can get him back on the stream. And then I'll stay back and take questions at the end. OK, so I apologize. We're running a little bit over, uh, but I'll, I'll come back on. Nice to see you, Avi. Thanks again. Really appreciate you joining us for this. So you let me know when you want to move slides and I'll let you take over. OK, okay. apologies for that. I was going to say, so clearly Dr. Rahman's portfolio career and my portfolio career are very unique to ourselves. Now, there is, however, a crossover in that many aspects, such as organization is required. Every single day, you no longer have a set schedule. The, there's discipline in planning your uh, work and managing money. Um, you've got a different paycheck every month. There, there's challenges you might face, possibly financially, socially, even, even wider. For example, how do you think my conversation went with my Indian parents when I told them I'm going to go off and become a yoga teacher. I'll come back to that later, but I promise it's got a happy ending. In any portfolio career, there's also a crossover of many positive aspects. The absolute happiness gained by following a passion alongside general practice. The work-life balance. The earning potential that you're fully in control of. Avi? I mean, people are still struggling. Can you just come right close to your mic and also okay. sort of like almost shout? Okay, apologies. Okay, I'll, I'll raise it as much as I can. I was saying there's also a lot of positive things that can come from a portfolio career that, uh, that is unique, and that is the organization, uh, sorry, the happiness you can gain from following an additional passion along with general practice, a work-life balance, and the earning potential that you're fully in control of. But also, I genuinely believe you will never meet burnout. And that's because you are doing something that you love and that you're also passionate about. So if we bring up the slides, thank you for putting them up. I mentioned I'm a portfolio GP with, uh, with a, a hot yoga teacher as well. And I have a passion for yoga, fitness, and lifestyle medicine. These are my medical roles. I've been practicing since 2009. I'm currently a locum. I do out of hours work. I do COVID hub, sh hub shifts. And I'm also, a, I've been a partner in both training and non-training practices. I'm the Kilmarnock Football Club crowd doctor, and I cover amateur boxing, kickboxing um, events, and also I've been a freelance examiner for eMedica. I'll add in, there is nowhere else I would recommend someone to go when they're learning about becoming a GP, uh, other than the safe, trustworthy, and quality teaching that you'll get with Dr. Rahman and the eMedica team. I did all their courses through my training and even those for a newly qualified GP. Uh, I even tune in for your monthly seminars because the learning never ends. If you can change it on to the next slide. And my non-medical roles are, I have been a hot, te hot yoga teacher since 2016. I've been practicing this yoga since 2014. And within six months, I fully rehabilitated a chronic injury to my right knee. I have a torn meniscus on both sides, and it's never felt stronger. I also gained kind of benefits and concentration. So it led me to go on and do the teacher training in Thailand. I was a traveling teacher for a short period. Uh, you can see the areas I've been to in Australia, United States, really learned from some of the best in the game around the world about this yoga. I teach regularly in Scotland, and since COVID, I now exclusively teach online through live virtual Zoom classes, and I've had to adapt to that. I'm also certified to teach in Yoga for Health, which is a, a really strong uh, initiative to bring yoga informally in, into the NHS. This is for the Yoga and Health Alliance. Uh, there's got some evidence base behind that, and it involves some chair yoga. And lastly, look, I manage a family property business with my, uh, since 2014. So I understand the dynamics of a family business as well. So I'll just bring it to the last slide. I'll put that up. I'm available uh, on a few different things. The, the Instagram's there. There's a link tree uh, where you can learn a bit about the different, st uh, the, the how to approach a hot yoga class. And I've put my email address up as well. If any of you are interested in trying some free hot yoga, drop me a like. Look, I'm gonna end this with this. I genuinely believe you have picked one of the best careers there are, okay? Every patient contact, every time you see that person in front of you that is coming that is a little bit vulnerable, that should be taken as a privilege. 
and a learning opportunity to learn something about that person, to learn something about yourself, but also to learn something about medicine. My only tip I will give for general practice is treat every patient as if they are your relative and watch what happens. I also believe that every one of you have transferable skills. This is things like determination, sustainability, and leadership qualities that you could use to approach any role out there. So if you've got an interest, if you've got a passion in something, whatever it is, this doesn't have to be a major earning potential, but if there's something and you don't know how to bring it into your life, then drop me a line or Dr. Rahman, and we can arrange a virtual team. But I'll open it up for some questions. Thank you very much, Avi. Um, and uh, you know, thanks very much for giving me your time. I think that you know, will inspire a lot of people. So we're going to open up. If anyone's got a question that you'd like to ask Avi, uh, please ask. Um, and then I will take general questions uh, about GP training after that. And I'll stay back a little bit to, to answer some of those. OK, um, so uh, someone's asked a really good question. Uh, this is from Felipe. He said, how do you avoid overdoing what you love and avoid burnout? That's a great question. Yeah, it's a brilliant question. Okay, so how do you avoid overdoing what you love? Okay, my question, my first question would be, are you doing the thing that you truly love? We talked about this just the other day, myself and Dr. Rahman. He was preparing slides, or, or he was due to prepare things for this. He'll happily stay up till three in the morning. I will happily teach, and, I, and I'll put this in, I will teach yoga for free. And the, and the reason is, you love it. When it's your passion, nothing becomes burnout. That's what I was trying to say. When you find you're doing something because you're chasing money or you're chasing some other status or something from it, now there has to be the right balance between the earning. But if you find what you truly love, if you really look inside yourself and think, what would I do for free? And I would just keep doing it, then I don't believe burnout exists. Thanks very much, Avi. And, and, you know, just to echo that, you know, um, I've got young family. I work more than full time. I've got my own practice and then I've got, you know, e medica to run. But I still enjoy doing these. You know, we do these free webinars and we started them in, in lockdown. We kept it going because people were finding it useful. And, you know, I love every interaction. Every time I can teach someone, if I feel I can help someone, I'm only where I am because someone helped me along the way. You know, if you're passionate about something, it's very difficult to get burnt out from it. Yes, you do need to mind that you need to give time to your family, you need to give time to exercise, you need to give time to other things. That that's all very important. But absolutely, that if you, you know, when people burn out, often it's because they're doing something, and it might not be the job itself, but it might be the environment they're doing that job in, or the people they're around. But it's when that happiness isn't there, that passion, that joy isn't there. Okay, so. Um, let's just see someone else has asked um someone asked how did you become uh, involved to be a gp for a soccer team a football team all right okay so i i have always loved football um and i'm from Kilmarnock. i'm from that area i live in that area so i actually did approach my father a few years back it got passed down to me my father's also a gp my brother's a gp and it just got passed down to me to do it again it's not a lucrative job but if you enjoy football you get to go along to a game, you get to take a friend with you, you both get to sit in the kind of VIP place and have a meal, and you sit in the VIP box and watch a game. So if you enjoy football, it's a, it's a brilliant thing to do, and um, you can approach any team locally and just ask. They're always on the lookout. Any sporting uh, setup is always on the lookout for medical cover. Great, thanks very much. Um, someone's asked, Which sources and websites can you access to find opportunities to do different portfolio jobs? Um, so perhaps I can start on that. I, I think you know a, a good starting point for these things is that if you can find someone that's doing what it is you're interested in, just talk to them. A lot of these jobs never get advertised, and you just need to go and talk to someone, and then you know like you make a connection and sometimes you'll just go and shadow someone or do something for free. And then someone will say, okay, look, we'll let you come on and try it. Uh, if you wanna get a general overview about portfolio careers, different options out there, we do do a course, which I think, Avi, before you started expanding into different things, you came to our course for doctors who are qualified, CCT plus, where we cover you know, how to develop a portfolio career, different options, uh, but also 
practical things like how to negotiate a contract, um, you know, which can be really useful because there's not a standard pay scale for a lot of these portfolio things. So uh, that would be a good starting point is when you're coming to the end of your training or if you're being qualified, come to our CCT plus course um, and that will give you a good start on how to go about these things. But I'll let Avi mention how he got involved in some of these things as well. Yeah, I would echo what you say. Usually there's going to be someone out there that is doing what you're thinking of. For example, I appreciate mine's quite out with medicine in some ways. I mean, I, for me, I feel yoga, I love lifestyle medicine. So I think actually yoga and medicine meet so that they, they join in some ways. But you can also have a portfolio career where you have more of an interest in things like pediatrics or in accident emergency. I, I did that for a while during my GP training. So there's always different things that you can consider. And yes, I did go in that course um, post CCT. So I really enjoyed it. Okay. Um, someone's asked that many of the things that they really like ask for prior experience. So, you know, if you're trying to get into something you've got no experience in, how would you start? So, so, so this is something you, you want to try a role and you have no experience. Yeah. So I would do exactly what Dr. Ravan just said a wee minute ago. Go up to them and say, can I come and shadow or can I work for free? There's, there's no one that is not going to take that on. If, you, if you're interested, if you're passionate in something and you say, look, I, I want to try and develop this, but I'm also a GP, you, you, they'll take you on board with, with, without a doubt. And if, if you're really struggling with it, drop, drop me a wee line, we'll have a chat. You might want to go kind of more narrow into specifics that you're thinking, but, but I, would, I would offer your service and time for a short period for free. One for you, Avi. Someone said, how do you, how much time do you recommend one should work as a GP each week to keep your knowledge and skills up to date? Because of course, medicine's always evolving. Uh, so that's, a, that's a great question. Okay, so I personally am someone who always really enjoyed CPD. I would always make time, full-time GP partner uh, during all my different training jobs. And in fact, this might relate, this might add value. When I did every job, before I got into the GP registrar job, and I, I got this tip from the eMedica guys, make every job count. So I, in Obzingen, I did DRCOG, I did DFR, SRH, I did my DGM when I did my geriatrics job, I did ATLS, ALS, EPLS. Now, if you, you're constantly doing things specific to the, the job that you're in, you, you, it will build up. But in terms of what you said, how much should you do, it's down to you as a person. Actually, I found when I drop sessions, I've gone from a nine session, I probably do on average between four and five sessions a week. But what I found was it created more time for me to go and do CPD. Opportunities like this, um, I, I always try and go to evening meetings if I can do it. There's not going to be a right level, but you're going to find your best learning style and you probably are going to develop that through your GP training. Fantastic. And, and uh, just to add on to that, one of the things I would say is when you're newly qualified as a GP, I would recommend you'll be very competent by the time you finish training. But the, the bulk of learning to be a great GP isn't in GP training. It's the next 35 years when you're doing the job. You know, um, I qualified 2007, a couple of years before AVI. To this day, every clinic I'm learning. So what I would say is the first couple of years after you qualify, try to do, you know, really focus on doing the clinical work and just not just you, you'll be competent but getting confident just so that you can you know if you cut down your sessions too much very early on and try to add too many things in your portfolio before you get really confident with the clinical stuff you can find that you haven't actually developed that level of confidence so early on i think it's good to get that locked in and then after that you can start dropping clinical sessions and start adding on other things. And some things will, you'll find like getting involved. Someone's just asked, how could you get involved in helping out with uh, medical education with eMedica? So, you know, the first thing I would say is if you're interested in getting involved, we're always recruiting freelance authors. So people to write sample cases for things like this or our uh, CSA bank or sample cases for AKT or even for SRA or medical finals. Um, and then often from there, opportunities will come. So like, you know, Avi got involved doing some of these things. I remember you did some CSA stuff for us, um, cases. And then, you know, we were looking for another trainer to come on to act as one of the examiners. And Avi had been through the course. He'd done really well, um, you know, and so, you know, we trained him up. We have a course 
to train people up. Uh, he came and shadowed for a while, um, and and then eventually you know, started working with us. So you know, that would be a good first step. Is you know drop us an email if you're interested in writing for us. Um, you could write an article for the blog. Or you could write some questions, and then it might grow from there. Someone's asked a more general question. I think that uh, I think what we'll do is we'll probably leave it there, Abby. Um, I'd like to say a huge thank you on behalf of everyone for you giving up your time, especially all the way from Spain, um, and, and you know for sharing your sort of inspirational journey. And I think you get some really good tips that, you know, if you're interested in doing something, go for it. And that some of the skills that you're going to get, they'll help you for anything in life, you know? So thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to add before I'll just take some general questions and I'll wrap up? Yeah, just the last thing I want to say, look, I want to wish every single person every success in your particular exams and whatever role you chose to do, just follow something, happiness, should be the goal and when you find that balance everything will come together and just the last thing look everyone has been affected by covid in different ways so please don't miss this opportunity to focus on your breath your fitness and your lung health it doesn't need to take long you don't have to do a full yoga class you can take five deep breaths every morning there's simple things you can do drop me an email if you get interested in take care Thanks very much, Avi. Really appreciate you giving up time. I'm going to join one of your, your classes soon, okay? And I might see some of these doctors on there with me, okay? Thanks very much. I'll, I'll catch you soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, so for those of you that are still there, I'm just going to do a very quick summary um, and I'll let you head off. Uh, thank you to everyone and a huge thank you again to Avi for joining us. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Please do sign up for next month. I'll send out the links in a week or two once we confirm a date for next month, okay? Um, and for those of you sitting the exam in October. Look, this last week is crucial. Keep pushing, keep going. All of your hard work is gonna pay off and you know, just keep it up. I know you're fed up of studying now, but keep going and it'll all be worthwhile when you see that big tick. Prepare and you will succeed. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone.